of life, protecting archaeological resources, or we were talking about deforestation, if you can employ uh, a local population in some way that protects the forest, but also makes that forest an attraction uh, for people and gives the local population, feeds money into that local population, then it benefits the local community and protects the forest resources. So we've been talking about um, these clashes between global and, uh, and local communities. But it's not just global and local, it's communities with communities. As we become interconnected, there are going to be changes taking place in the ways of life of different communities. Uh, and they can be voluntary or forced, and they are the result of when groups come into continuous first-hand contact um, with one another. This is a process called acculturation. And it's changing changes in the cultural patterns of either or both groups when they come into contact with one another. Uh, one of these that we, we dealt with in last chapter was uh, this concept of, of white man's burden and mission civilatrice. Um, but many times this is re described as westernization. And this is really an imbalanced relationship that westernization uh, has grew out of uh, uh, or, or grew in, in power through colonialism, and that was an imbalanced relationship between the core and the periphery nation, between the colonizer and the colonized. And so it was really hard, and it was a struggle for indigenous populations to maintain their own culture uh, in this. So this is where acculturation can actually be forced upon people, or they would be find it hard to resist those transitions that are taking place. This can uh, lead to inter-ethnic conflict, which can have varying levels of destruction, domination, resistance, survival, adaptation, and modification of native uh, ways of life. The most extreme forms of these uh, inter-ethnic contacts can be things like genocide, where one culture wants to eliminate through killing another culture. Um, a little more subtle um, than just uh, direct contact is what's called cultural imperialism, and uh, the op flip side of that is indigenization. Cultural imperialism is uh, the spread or advance of one culture at the expense of another. So something like if I go to Germany today, I'm probably going to bump into some McDonald's or Coca-Cola products. Those are very clearly from America. They're identified with American uh, America, but they have spread into another culture, not by domination of America over another, but through um, imposition or um, replacing other local institutions. It may be their choice, in fact, to bring it. It must be, in fact, the Germans, I'm pretty sure, like McDonald's. Uh, so they, they include them as part of their culture. And so, but this is a, a form of cultural imperialism. It's benefiting one, uh, and it um, uh, usually uh, destroys some of the... Um, the uh, comparable cultural and social institutions into which that imperialism is, is advancing. Now, the opposite of uh, this is, is, or sort of opposite of this, is what's called indigenization, which is the process by which people modify or borrow forms uh, to fit into their local culture. Um, so rather than one imbalanced culture imperializing another one, it's the other way around, that the smaller community um, uh, modifies or borrows forms to fit into their local culture. And this can happen in either direction. So uh, if I um, uh, incorporate some ind indigenous cultures um, uh, features into my own, uh, into my own cultural identity, that could be um, a form of indigenization. And this can actually lead to um, uh, conflicts because I may be appropriating certain cultural uh, symbols and uh, things, uh, the ways of uh, practices that are not part of my culture and it could be offensive to people who this is their traditional way of life. Um, 
the fact that we are able to communicate through digital media has only upped the the scale of these processes as well. So um, the spread of, of national and uh, indigenous cultural identities is enhanced and uh, and um, the pace of distribution uh, has just increased in the past few years. Um, and indigenous people participate, they do participate in the modern world system through their things like market labor, They people produce like indigenous products that can be sold and images that are uh, produced, but they are often uh, either self-marketed um, or they're appropriated by capitalists in the world system. Um, so this can cause even um, a uh, a distinction between people that are want to maintain traditionalism and those who want to actually sell uh, the traditional way of life in a and but participate in a modern capitalist economy. Um, so there's a balance, and uh, and it's not the job of anthropologists to um, place values on these. It's the job of the anthropologist to identify where these potential um, differences of opinion can lie. Uh, that is by by pointing these out and having the facts, then maybe policymakers can have a better way of uh, of finding a way through some of these challenges. Um, because in the past we lived in uh, smaller communities and uh, we we weren't connected so globally, some of the old boundaries and distinctions have been erased by uh, um, by this global connectivity. And so I can communicate with someone on the other side of the world who is also an archaeologist, even though they're not part of my community. We have something in common because we are both part of an academic community that studies similar things. And so I can communicate with them. I have that in common. So in one sense, it's enlarged some identities and some communities, and it has uh, erased the boundaries between things. Um, and so, uh, in a sense, people live multi-locally today, that is to say, in different places at once. And so, uh, my identity is not just here where I'm sitting, it's also worldwide. I'm communicating and publishing things with people all around the world today as part of the job that I do. Um, and so, one concept that has come up uh, in anthropology in recent years is what's called post-modernity which is referring to the collapsing of old distinctions, rules, canons, categories, and things like that. And for anthropologists, this is really important because traditionally we've looked at the last few chapters of all of these components of culture and the way culture works. And some of those things are collapsing and they're, those distinctions that we drew are being redrawn on new lines based on the globally connected world. Um, so... Uh, I think um, that's really where I want to, to um, end it with maybe uh, just a recollection of what we were talking about in some of the earliest chapters about, about um, emic versus etic. That remember that the emic perspective, um, being native to, formed in the place where a particular culture is found, um, autochthonous, um, being an insider is one way to look at things. And this is something that anthropologists need to understand the emic, the lived experience of a cultural viewpoint. But we also uh, need to understand uh, the terminology that a scientist would use to describe that without reducing ourselves to something like essentialism. And essentialism is a process of viewing an identity as established, as real, as frozen, and ignoring the historical processes and the politics within which that identity is developed and formed. So the etic perspective allows us to take a step back from a culture, understand the emic, but also look at it through time, look at it through historical processes, and look at it in this global world, and try and come up with some facts that maybe can help some people to apply that anthropology 
uh, for people's benefit. All right, that's, that's it for now.